Hey everybody, it's pal Drew Dracy, yet to gain. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Submariner and more importantly his creator, Bill Everett. Um, Bill Everett, uh, he came from money. His dad uh, had a very successful trucking business that wasn't affected by the crash of 29 or the depression. And uh, even though uh, Bill was, you know, living comfortably or his family was, he developed tuberculosis at 12 and uh his mother took him out of school and for four months uh his mother and his sister uh, cared for him and back then tuberculosis it was like a coin flip whether you live or die that's how serious it was uh so but he did get better and never went back to school but uh shortly afterwards like not that long after his bout with tb he had a second bout with tb and I'm sure they were terrified that he was, they were going to lose him. But, uh, you know, he rallied eventually. And uh, he wanted to be uh, an artist, uh, you know, doing... Uh, he just wanted to make a living as an artist. And his parents supported him. And I'm not just saying financially. It's just, you know, if you have this big wig guy who owns this huge trucking company, you know, he might be like, oh, you're just going to be an artist. And, you know, I'll, I'll hire you. You could take on the family business when I die and stuff like that. But no, his parents were actually encouraging him and because uh, they saw something in him. So they sent him to Boston uh, where he attended Vesper George School of Art. And uh, that's hard for me to spit out. <laughs> but um, let me go back to the beginning. In the 1930s, pulp novels began to lose popularity and publishers began to make comics that were solely reprints of uh, the more popular newspaper strips. And what's crazy to even imagine, like, you know, almost 10, 100 years later, newspaper strips affected newspaper circulations. I'm talking substantially. A lot of towns back then, uh, or larger, more like cities, they had two newspapers that were always competing with each other. And if one paper carried more popular comic strips, their circulation would skyrocket and the second would be an also ran. Um, so and what happened was uh, comic books kind of came about uh, by because the strips that were popular got reprinted in a small magazine format, you know, a comic book proportions. And uh, they did very well. And, uh, but after a while, I mean, it was hitting so hard and so quick that they quickly needed, uh, uh, they needed new <laughs> material. So, uh, they were looking all around. Um, they got Siegel and Schuster and Submariner came around about less than a year later. And it's fascinating because in both cases, these characters are fully formed. The creators know the, the temperament, the position, that they're uh, like the, how they they kind of know what these characters would say and not say. They're very consistent, which is amazing because you know there's still a lot of creators who can't pull that off, cannot pull that off. Um, so uh, Everett's creation in the Submariner it appeared in Motion Pictures Funnies Weekly, which was to be a comic book that would be given away at movie theaters. Um, but the plan was unsuccessful, so uh, suddenly if there were a few copies that supposedly were made, but I don't know. I haven't seen it. It may be a myth. Who knows? And if so, uh, if there's one existing, it probably has to be the rarest comic book of all time. And uh, so this Submariner story was intended for uh, that uh, that reprint title with uh, the motion pictures, funnies, weekly uh, I have to make sure I say that right. I don't know why. It's just hard for me to spit out. Um, so this ended up in Marvel Comics, which was published by Timely Comics, but they were not known as Marvel Comics. They Timely, I don't know why. Maybe it was just, that's such a kind of a lame, kind of flaccid kind of title. And when they had books like Marvel Tales, Marvel Mystery Tales, and like other Marvel stuff, they should have just changed your name to Marvel. and uh, But, you know, who knows? Who cares? Um, I'm just glad we got these strips. And I think a lot of people are, too. But So, the original Human Torch 
came out the same issue that disappeared in, uh, which was Marvel Comics number one. And this is a year before Captain America would show up. So you had these three very prominent, huge, like successful characters. And, you know, it was great world building because uh, to my knowledge, I don't know a lot of comics that had so many characters together. And I think it was like Superman and Batman. And then it was, uh, you had the Justice League or Justice Society, which I think was published by another company that got bought out by uh, Detective Comics, which were changed or named DC Comics. Um, so, uh, you know, Bill Everett was encouraged to go to that to Boston's Vesper George School of Art. His parents uh, encouraged him, uh, and uh, you know he got in. It was he got to do comics, and he was very successful at it. And uh, he did more and more, and it was just getting more and more uh, readers. Uh, and then in uh, I guess around 1942, he had to uh, attend. Uh, he go to the army and attend office candidate school at Fort Belvoir, if that's how you say it, in Fairfax, Virginia, close to the District of Columbia, where he met his soon-to-be wife, uh, Gwen Randall, who was working for the Ordnance Department at the Pentagon. Now, that's a kick-ass position, <laughs> you know? And I used to live really close to Fairfax. I was in Fairfax County, in fact. I lived in Springfield, Virginia. So it's like the very tip of northern uh, uh, Virginia. So, um... That, that was kind of cool and uh, when I read that and uh, but I was always in the move always I was always staying one step ahead of the law I'm just a lawless dork <laughs> and uh, but uh, he uh, Gwen Randall who eventually married uh, Bill Everett she'd given birth to their first child but then he was sent to the Philippines to fight in the Pacific theater and while Everett was away other creators stepped in to write and draw Namor. Uh, Carl Pfeiffer, or Pfeiffer, was a standout because uh, his version of Namor had a wild triangle-shaped head. And Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer, his art wasn't nearly as clever or detailed as Everett's, but the story, just, storytelling skills were still strong. And, uh, you know, that's half the battle right there. I know some people today that could learn how to do storytelling said the middle-aged guy um so uh but what's really fascinating about this is not just the origin of submariner but bill everett you could see he's doing something different here uh, and what's amazing is his art started off pretty strong with a lot of very solid understanding of what a strip like this would require and this really put him his name on the map and oddly enough his last work before he passed away was a return to Submariner. And more amazingly was that his stuff was not the same. It wasn't, uh, it didn't go down. It was exceptional. It was exceptional. He left on a high note. Um, and what I like about this is some of the shading. I th it looks like it's done by pencil, but the coloring is really advanced. And this has not been recolored. This was after uh, a Marvel Masterworks uh, uh, by uh, Corey Siedlmeyer. He overlooks the uh, reproduction process. So this was uh, intended to be that uh, comic book at the movie theaters. And uh, it was going to end with this. And they just said, hey, give us a few more pages. So he did. Which I didn't learn for a long time. <clears throat> excuse me uh which i didn't learn for a long time so uh you know it's just a little extra stuff a little padding and it's not as lovingly detailed uh because i think he just but it is exciting it's very exciting a spiral staircase that ain't easy to draw i mean you you would see a lot of terrible hacks that start off in the early comics and didn't matter because comics were just really taking off so you had like you also had knockoff artists and knockoff uh characters um when simon and kirby did captain america so many other artists followed their exciting storytelling uh ways the devices that they used um and uh let me think i think submariner was still uh he's it was sort of like his strip was 
uniquely his, Carl Burgess's Human Torch, which came out the same issue, Marvel Tales, uh, 1939, and Captain America, they they were very consistent. They they were like he didn't Carl Burgess he it was his baby, the torch, and Bill Everett's baby was Namor. And he would even later do a copy of his own character called the Finn, which was under another underwater guy, and he was a normal guy, except he had a fin on his mask, and uh he he solved cases underwater, I suppose. But uh anyway, so that that's where it started off, you know, good stuff, good stuff. So uh, here's a picture of Bill Everett, and uh, I love that. Some people say that was like maybe it was a posed picture, or maybe it wasn't, but I don't care. That's such a great time capsule of that of the days way back when, and uh, when everybody was smoking, which was not really cool anymore. I mean, a lot of people stopped smoking, thankfully. Um, except those stupid e-cigarettes. Um, well, let me get. To, I'm trying to figure out what order to do this. Um, bah, 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 bah. Well, he did. He came back to the Submariner for a, a few. I'll just hold this up while I'm talking. He came back to Submariner uh, after the war was over, and, and then it didn't last very long. Superheroes are going away they were kind of needed to boost morale in the armies and navy air force marines actually no it was oss was uh, i don't know <laughs> anyway they were there to uh, boost uh you know infantrymen everybody's morale and after the w war people didn't really want to see that kind of stuff anymore so romance comics started to become a thing as well as uh, uh western comics and western really took off with tv uh, so many shows and so many movies and they reused a lot of the same sets and stuff i'm getting really way off course here but uh anyway bill everett uh he took a job as an uh advertising manager uh, art director uh f just at a regular advertising job uh and then later on he kind of I don't know if Stan Lee contacted him or if he contacted Stan Lee, but uh, he wanted to dip his toe in the water of uh, comic books again. And uh, it was interesting. We'll see what happens. First time that I recall that he came back to Marvel slash formerly Timely was Daredevil, number one. Um, just like Iron Man on Tales of Suspense uh, 39, Kirby did this cover another other, both books he designed them like right there you see how the design is and same with iron man and uh so that was like a reference he was really you know uh, kirby was really great with that kind of stuff um i'm gonna jump in here real quick and this let me say the first page is basically photo stat they put a lot of other stuff uh, and everett stuff is I, the line work and the storytelling it's all there first time i saw it was my cousin had sons of origins of superheroes by stan lee in 76 or 77 and uh not only was i stunned that uh, daredevil had such a wacky costume which actually looked kind of like a wrestling costume and uh came with the origin story you know that was uh Bill and Stan, I think, worked together on that. I'm not sure. This is back when Stan was more involved with the uh, creation of the characters or implementing them or helping them come along. So, uh, this is just... This art is still great. The only thing is, Bill Everett, he still had his advertising job. And it took him most of a year... To finish this 23 page story of daredevil it just he couldn't do a full-time job as advertising uh, art director i mean i was an advertising manager uh, before i got into comics and i basically quit the job to take on a a meager job so i could do my portfolio for weekends and evenings because uh, there's no way i could have done both because uh, i was putting in 14 hour days and i'm sure everett was as well so and towards the end of this first issue, uh, supposedly Steve Ditko and uh, maybe Joe Orlando or somebody uh, contributed uh, either the inks or the layouts. 
and uh, I can't really tell where because that, that's definitely looks like a uh, Bill Everett face there. And uh, anyway, second issue never came. Uh, and what happened was almost there was a lot of time between issue one and two, and uh, Stan had to fill out a schedule in the limited eight comics a month that DC uh, would allow. You know, the, uh, the a bigger company distributing Marvel. And Daredevil kind of, it took a while. There wasn't going to be a second issue of it. And in his place, it was, um, excuse me, the first issue took all, took a year. So in that, in that time span, there was an, an open uh, book uh, that needed to be done. And it was Avengers number one. So it wasn't necessarily out of the blue. It was there to fill a publishing hole. And uh, so when it finally came out, and then Joe Orlando and Vince Coletta, they banged it out like a few issues until Wally Wood would get on there and they would have a regular uh, publishing. And, uh, you know, it, both these artists have done nice work elsewhere, but uh, it's really wonky. Well, that's it for Bill Everett, uh, part one. I'll be continuing this because I decided I don't want to do a 45 hour long uh, episode because. Uh, you know, it, it just because. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.